Welcome, hello again, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Bob Continetti, Senior Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and I'll be your moderator for this faculty town hall. Once again, we're going to have a group of panelists to provide some updates on our operations during the COVID-19 pandemic and to answer your questions. Some questions were submitted during registration, but I encourage everybody to feel free to use the question and answer Q&A window on Zoom to submit additional questions for our panelists during the town hall. Due to our time limitations, we'll not be able to get to all of your questions, but we will log the questions as they come in and post the answers on the Return to Learn website. And uh, the link to that uh, should be showing up. Now, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our Chancellor, Pradeep Kosla, for some welp welcoming remarks. Chancellor Kosla. Bob, thank you very much, sir. Uh, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Um, for a very, after a very, very long time and for a change, I come here bearing some very good news for all of us today. So I'm hoping that my comments to you all will be more positive across the board than you've ever seen before. And by the way, this is close to a one year anniversary of when we first uh, decided to uh, send our students home and uh, go remote overnight. First of all, we are seeing far fewer positive cases on campus, and you'll hear more about this. Uh, we have moved from tracking the number of positive results each day, we're still doing that, uh, to tracking the number of days without a positive result. Uh, and this is actually good news. Uh, positive cases in the county, as you've been watching or reading the newspapers, have also gone down. Uh, and we expect San Diego County in the very near, near future, sometime as soon as the end of this week or early next week, to move into the red tier. Uh, and then the restrictions will begin to relax. And this is where we need to be careful. Uh, here on campus, as we have done before, we will continue to look to the science and to our in-house experts for guidance. Our science and our experts have done an extremely good job of helping us uh, managing this pandemic. Uh, we will consider what's best for our community before making adjustments to protocols or safety operations. The county, as you know, uh, has opened up phase 1B vaccination and the state also has identified <coughs> uh, educational institutions or educational workers uh, as a priority for vaccination right now. So we are basing our prioritization on what we have uh, seen from the state. So here's where the good news starts. All employees on our campus uh, will receive uh, invitations for vaccinations. To ensure that the most vulnerable of our community are vaccinated first, we have, we have developed a vaccination prioritization plan. And this plan is developed by our doctors, our faculty from public health, our faculty from campus. Uh, so there's a lot of input into this. Uh, and uh, I think it has been going really well. So in our stage approach, all employees who are eligible will be invited to schedule an appointment at REMAC through my chart. So let me start with what's happening right now. So first of all, every faculty member will receive an invitation. Uh, and here's latest, my latest information. All faculty have been invited and all academic research students have been invited. All graduate students and fellowships have been invited today. So if you think you should, should have been invited or your students should have been invited and you're not, please send an email and fill out a form, rtl at ucsd.edu. That is a place uh, to deal, that's a place where you need to uh, send your issue and then there will be people in the background who will resolve the issue. So today, 51% of campus employees have been vaccinated. 68% of campus academic Senate employees have been vaccinated. I'm sorry, 68% of campus academic Senate members, not employees, have been vaccinated. 62% of health academic Senate members have been vaccinated. So you can see there's a whole lot of uh, uh, momentum out here behind our vaccination plan. And for this vaccination plan, I wanna say a big thank you to the leadership of Patty Basip, the, the CEO of our hospital, and also to the committee that has been prioritizing this. Uh, I think across all the UCs, uh, one more time, uh, we, are one, we are yet one more time a leader in vaccinating our people uh, before other people are vaccinating because our people have been vaccinating San Diego County, uh, uh, people, live, people living in San Diego County through Petco Park. Uh, okay, so that's where we are. Sometime by the end of this week or next week, early next week, we'll send, out a, uh, we'll send out a memo about fall semester, or sorry, fall quarter opening. And I can tell you, we're all looking forward to 
an opening which would be more in person than not. Uh, we will also be sending out a memo on what the graduation is gonna look like. It seems that the governor is gonna opine on, or the governor's office is gonna give some guidance on what the graduation is gonna look like. So we are in conversation with the provost and the deans to look at what the graduation is gonna look like. So in the next week or two, there's gonna be several announcements coming out, all positive, I hope. And again, thank you very much uh, for being part of this community, for really supporting the community uh, and for uh, supporting our students. So back to you, Bob, sir. Well, thank you for that good news, Chancellor Kozla. Now I would like to welcome the, the host of today's town hall, UC San Diego Executive Vice Chancellor, Elizabeth Simmons. Elizabeth. Thanks very much, Bob. Well, as Chancellor Kosla remarked, it's been one year since we transitioned abruptly to the remote learning environment, a change that we had hoped would just be a temporary disruption for a few weeks or months. But here we are, um, and I'd like to thank all of you, our faculty, for your ongoing support of the university community, because your flexibility, your compassion for your students, and your overall commitment to supporting fellow Tritons have enabled us to uphold our research standards, our educational standards, and our service mission through this tumultuous time. Well, remote instruction was a largely unfamiliar educational model for our university a year ago, and the experience of the past year has presented various challenges, but as we heard from many of our colleagues at the Educational Innovation Expo last week, it has also offered some benefits for educators and students and revealed opportunities to improve the way that we educate and give access to diverse learners. Exploring these opportunities as we go forward will not only allow us to continue, but indeed strengthen the way we serve our university community so that all of our faculty, staff, and students can succeed and thrive here at UC San Diego. It's a great pleasure to join today's town hall as we discuss the latest developments in response to the pandemic. We'll hear about the improving county situation and the wider uh, range of vaccination plans. We'll hear about plans for spring break, um, information on maintaining and enhancing our research presence. And I just wanted to pick up a little bit on what the chancellor alluded to about fall. Um, our aspirations are for a relatively more traditional looking fall with students and faculty expected to be back in residence again, teaching returns to predominantly in-person and synchronous, of course, with accommodation being made for individuals with special situations. And because fall course scheduling happens now, to preserve all of our options, and in particular, the option to have an in-person fall we'll build the fall schedule as in-person because that gives us the greatest range of flexibility overall. Um, that will allow us to do in-person teaching in the fall if the county health guidelines in the fall permit that to happen. And in the meantime, there will be plenty of opportunity to make any necessary adjustments as the science and the county guidelines dictate. Of course, we'll have backup options for fall, including a readiness to pivot remote if that's what the county requires of us. And of course, including uh, maintaining our outdoor teaching spaces for anybody who would, who would like to use them in fall. Well, I look forward to continuing conversations with you um, and uh, with uh, indeed everybody on campus about prospects for our post-pandemic future. But now I'd like to turn the floor over to my colleague, Senate Chair Stephen Constable, who will say a few words before we move on to the rest of the program. Steve? Thank you, Elizabeth, and hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to elaborate a little on what uh, uh, EVC Simmons has just uh, described for the fall. Um, even though fall quarter is over six months away and the class schedules are being made at this time. Um, and as we will hear today, um, the vaccination rollout along with falling numbers of COVID cases makes it most likely that by fall, everybody who wants vaccination will be able to get it and at last resume predominantly in-person teaching. Um, however, fall is a long way away. We're still working under a prohibition on indoor teaching. And so it's gonna be a while before we have full clarity on what fall quarter will look like. Some faculty are developing our courses in order to provide flexibility in the fall, which is fine, but our courses are not a good tool for delivering emergency remote instruction, uh, should that be necessary as we get closer to fall quarter. Our courses require careful development 
in consultation with the Teaching Plus Learning Commons and need to be approved by the Senate. They are in short, a lot of work to do properly and deliver properly. So the Academic Senate supports the idea that we will be mostly back in person teaching in the fall, but is prepared to provide exceptions to remote instruction as needed. Our advice is prepare for in-person teaching, but be assured that the Senate will provide the exceptions necessary where in-person teaching is not advisable. Uh, with that, thank you. I will pass it back to Bob. Thank you, Dr. Constable. So as, it, as has been mentioned, this week marks the one year anniversary of the cross campus response to COVID-19. So as we re reflect back on the past year, today we're gonna get a bit more interactive and ask three questions of you during, during these presentations using the polling function of Zoom. The polls will appear on your screen and you'll make a selection and please remember to click the submit button. So we're gonna start with our first question now. And that question is, Overall, I am satisfied with how my university is responding, managing the COVID-19 crisis. To answer, you're, as you can see, you will uh, choose from a scale of very satisfied to very unsatisfied. So if we can please uh, go ahead and fill that in. Looking back from my own perspective over the last year, it's really been a marathon of crisis management, a year of relentless challenges and not just the COVID-19 pandemic. We were challenged by confronting racism in our society, coupled with one of the most chaotic political environments in our history. Yet, we've gotten through it together and uh, I'm proud of that. Well, uh, perhaps everybody's had a chance to uh, make their selection. Uh, great, let's take a look at the results. And uh, we, we really appreciate that feedback. Thank you. Now, I'd like to move on to uh, introduce our first presenters today, Dr. Chip Schooley, Professor of Medicine and Dr. N Natasha Martin, Associate Professor of Medicine. They're going to update us on the state of the pandemic, the vaccine rollout, and provide us with information regarding public health predictions and the modeling outlook for fall 21. Dr. Martin. Good afternoon, everybody. So I will talk a little bit about where we are in terms of the pandemic. Here you can see the um, daily new confirmed cases in the United States, which, um, as you know, has been declining since our surge over in the Christmas and New Year period. Um, but there have been concerns that the rate of decline has been slowing. So as you can see on the right hand side of this figure, you know that the, the curve is not nearly as steep in terms of the drop of the cases. And there is concern that as some um, settings start to reopen that we may see a, a potential second surge. So we're monitoring that closely. Next slide, please. The situation in San Diego mirrors that um, uh, in the state as well as the country in terms of our continued declines in case rates. Um, it's that case rate measure in the top left that is what's keeping us in the purple tier. Uh, this slide's showing it at 10.8 um, cases per 100,000 individuals per day. We actually just got our revised case rate just a few hours ago, and that has gone down further to 8.8 .8 per 100,000 per day. Um, and just putting that in context of we're looking for a, a number below at or below seven in order to be able to proceed into the red tier. But um, based on the recent um, continued declines in cases and the fact that this case rate is a lagged measure, we anticipate that to occur in the, the near future. Next slide, please. So the, um, the situation on campus continues to improve. Um, and you can see here on the left-hand slide that we continue to do between 1,500 and 2,500 tests per day among our students. And in the center, you can see that the case, the number of cases diagnosed continues to decline. And in the last week, we've had you know, between zero, one, or two cases per day. Uh, total in the last seven days, we've had five student cases of students residing on campus to students residing off campus. And we've also seen a dramatic decline in the amount of activity among our campus employees, showing here on the right, we are testing about 500 employees per day, and most days have zero cases. In the last week, we've only had one campus employee case. So the, the situation really um, quite stable and good at the at this university level. Next slide, please. 
We also continue our um, ambitious wastewater monitoring program. We can uh, currently have 115 wastewater samplers, which are monitoring sewage from over 300 buildings on campus um, every day. The information is provided on our public daily dashboard. And what we've learned over the course of this year is that the wastewater is highly sensitive. So over 85% of our individual cases that we detected in, in residences were associated with a positive wastewater signal. Um, and so that it, it provides us an early warning in terms of um, infections in those buildings and the notifications themselves and a receipt of knowing that your building is positive is associated with increased testing and, and roughly doubles testing in the days after the notification. So that's all good news. Next slide. Um, and what you can see here, these are the actual wastewater results per day. So every column, every row is a wastewater sampler and every column is a day and the green is a negative sample. The red is a positive sample and the white is where we weren't able to collect a sample. It was clogged, the battery ran out. Um, but what you can see here in the black squares that over the month of our winter moving period in January, quite a lot of our samplers, over half of our samplers on any given day were positive. Um, but that has tailed off quite dramatically over on the right hand side, as you can see here, where, you know, in the past week, we've, we've been having maybe five to eight of our residential samplers positive, you know, less, less than 10%, um, corresponding with the decrease in, in cases that we're seeing on campus. So uh, supporting the situation, kind of improving campus wide. Next slide, please. One of the other things that we're tracking very closely is the spread of variants of concern. Um, Christian Anderson's team has been looking uh, across the United States where the particular variant here on this slide, the B1.1.7 variant first identified in the UK has been really identified uh, across the United States um, and is expanding in terms of the proportion of cases that are attributable to this variant, uh, increasing across states in, in California as well. And is something that we're concerned about because because of the increased transmissibility of this variant, as well as the um, increase in um, morbidity. Next slide, please. And so we're tracking the situation on campus. One of the things we can do now is we can we are tracking both we are um, sequencing both individual samples as well as the wastewater samples to be able to identify what variants are present and circulating on campus. This shows a kind of subtree of the sequences that we've uh, samples that we've sequenced here among the students. I mean, if you go to the next slide, please. One of the things we can do is, is color these trees to identify um, which variants are circulating. And so here the blue is sort of the non-California um, non, uh, variants and the red is indicating the, the two variants that make up the, the California lineage. Um, and so you can see here that we're able to track the presence of variants on campus. And so we now really have robust surveillance tools uh, to look for variants and in tandem with our increased wastewater coverage, as well as the sequencing of both the wastewater and the individual samplers are really in a good um, place in order to robustly monitor the uh, progression of variants and situation on campus moving forward. And now I'll turn it to Chip who will talk a little bit about vaccinations. Sure, we're beginning to see the momentum picking up a bit in terms of vaccination nationwide. We've had a slow couple of uh, weeks, uh, both because of storms and also because um, of some shortages in supplies. But over the next few weeks, we expect things to pick up. As you know, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was approved um, by the FDA last week, and uh, J&J is beginning to ship uh, their vaccine uh, around the country. We have some here in San Diego and indeed at UC San Diego Health. Uh, it's a nice vaccine because it's been given in a single injection uh, and doesn't require as much difficulty with the cold chain. I think that coupled with increasing um, availability of the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines is going to really help us uh, begin to make a bigger dent in the unvaccinated population. As you can see, California uh, is in the kind of upper uh, mid tier uh, for uh, where we are compared to the rest of the country. We've uh, at least 18% of California natives have gotten um, one dose and uh, not quite 10% have received two doses. Uh, so we're moving the right direction. Next. Now, uh, what's going on here is, as you know, we've had a super station at Petco Park, which has been running. Uh, the hospital set that up now, gosh, two months ago. And uh, it has really done a fantastic job in terms of vaccinating people, vaccinating 
uh, along with what we've done on campus. Uh, we are the number one you see in all the system for vaccinating people uh, and um, are really pleased to see that. Uh, these uh, sites are gonna remain open. Petco may have to move when the uh, Padres get here, that's still under discussion, uh, but uh, the tempo is limited only by the availability of vaccines. Uh, and the hospital has begun to operate some mobile vans, which will help us to give to populations that can't get to the two fixed sites. The Moderna vaccine shortfall continues. Uh, the, um, we've had a, a large population of people who received the first dose just before the shortages began and are waiting uh, to get the second dose. As I think you've probably heard from a number of sources, um, the um, three and four week um, intervals between first and second vaccinations for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines respectively um, were arbitrary time uh, courses that were established in the clinical trials in an effort to do this as quickly as possible. Uh, if this had not been a public health emergency, it's likely they would have spaced those uh, to uh, vaccinations out a bit further because in other vaccines that are given sequentially a little bit further out gives you a better booster effect. But in any case, we don't think there will be any long-term uh, loss by being delayed a few weeks on the second vaccination. And in fact, there may be a longer term gain. Uh, the way the hospital is handling this is that uh, people are being scheduled as vaccines available um, and vaccine that is predicted to get here doesn't always show up. So if uh, on the day you're supposed to be vaccinated, the vaccine shipment doesn't show up, uh, you're then uh, canceled and they kick you forward to the next vaccine availability. And what the uh, approach has been is to um, vaccinate people in the order of their first vaccination so that uh, we're trying to kind of get the people who have the longest lag first. Uh, if you haven't gotten a notification, you think you've gotten lost in the, uh, in the shuffle, uh, on the RTL uh, website, there is a banner that has a radio button, and you can fill out the form that Dr. Koshla mentioned uh, that will uh, help you um, uh, get the attention of the people who can look up uh, your uh, name in particulars and figure out what's going on. That uh, uh, website was just posted in the chat. Um, the, uh, I mentioned the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has arrived. It's going to be, uh, we'll begin to use it some next week. Not large amounts of it yet. Next. Now, on March 15th, the county is going to open vaccinations to people under the age of 65 who have uh, one of a number of predefined uh, pre-existing conditions. Uh, next. Now, these conditions are very uh, clearly laid out here. Uh, they include, um, as you'll see, cancer, chronic kidney disease, and so forth. Um, and in addition, people who have developmental or disabilities that make it difficult to uh, get to COVID care are all included on this list. The list isn't perfect. Uh, one could argue that some of these should be higher up in the priority list. Some people may have been left off that, uh, that were not included, uh, but uh, the uh, uh, effort here was to get things that seemed to be the most um, concerning without making it so complicated it couldn't be managed. Next. Now, the way this will work is those of you who get your health care uh, at UC San Diego uh, will have that these conditions are in your EPIC record, and you'll receive a, a notification that uh, an invitation to be vaccinated, a ticket, and you go through my chart and make an appointment like everyone else has been uh, on the age-based um, and employment-based um, approach over the last couple of months. If for some reason you don't receive a notification, again, use the same procedure that we've talked about, go to the uh, RTL banner, uh, punch the radio button and enter your information. Uh, if you get your care elsewhere, uh, they will have an analogous process uh, so that you can uh, get your uh, vaccine uh, through that uh, program as well. Uh, next. So we are uh, done at this point, and I see some questions that have come in. We'll address them later. Thank you, uh, Drs. Martin and Schooley, for your guidance and leadership today and over the past year in helping the university navigate these incredible challenges. And if you could just stay with me for a moment for the next poll question, as, and that is, let's, let's move on to that. As we consider the past year, we'd like to get your opinion on how satisfied you are with the level of communication surrounding our response to the COVID-19 crisis. As you can see uh, in, the, uh, in the window, uh, the, 
poll question is, I am satisfied with the university's level of communication, e.g. frequency, timeliness, breadth about the COVID-19 crisis with a graded uh, set of very unsatisfied to very satisfied. So please go ahead and fill that out. And then, but I was actually wondering, uh, uh, Dr. Martin, if you're, uh, if you're on, the, uh, on the line still, um, I was wondering, the deployment of the wastewater monitoring has been an interesting to watch as a really a rapidly developing research project. Do you think wastewater monitoring is gonna be a widely deployed public health measure even after the pandemic has subsided? I do. I mean, it's been used even before COVID in terms of monitoring, for example, polio eradication. And I think that it has received increased um, visibility and interest through COVID. Um, I think it's going to be particularly useful in the fall as case cases decline and people are um, vaccinated to really, uh, again, provide that very sensitive signal in terms of where we might see uh, cases. And moving forward, I think we will uh, think about brainstorm other ways in terms of how we can use it to monitor other their infectious diseases as well. All right, well, thank you. And I think we're ready for the results. Uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, very satisfied is dominating. So we appreciate that. And uh, we'll, we'll take it, we'll examine those uh, later as we figure out how to proceed in improving our communication. So next we're gonna hear from Vice Chancellor for, uh, for Student Affairs, Allison Satterland. And as the uh, as this uh, slide shows, she's going to tell us about plans for a safe spring break. Allison. Thanks, Bob. Thank you so much. So I, I believe I shared some of this uh, information with you all in a prior mm -hmm. town hall. So I'm really happy to be back with some more specifics that, you know, in support of our efforts to reduce the spread of the virus that causes COVID-19, our, our return to learn efforts included the development of a uh, stay safer, stay put spring break initiative. So Starting the evening of March 20th, uh, we will host a series of on-campus activities, masked outdoors and um, in groups uh, no larger than three uh, to encourage our students living in campus operated housing to stay with us during spring break or to reduce travel. Um, we have more than 80 in-person outdoor activities as well as remote and hybrid opportunities within several tracks, research, service, disability awareness, leadership, academic enrichment, adventure, art, and health and well-being. And we're proud to share that all of these activities meet one or more of the Teaching and Learning Commons co-curricular records 12 competencies. So I, I could uh, first thank all of our, our faculty partners and uh, PIs and um, postdocs and uh, graduate students who are hosting an undergraduate uh, participate in a research experience. What a, a special uh, uh, thank you for that. And I'd like to ask, please, our, our faculty and uh, staff partners on this town hall today to please consider encouraging your students to stay with us in beautiful San Diego for spring break. Thank you so much for the chance to highlight this collaborative effort. Uh, well, thank, thank you, Vice Chancellor Satterland. And, and if I may ask, could you stay on with me through the final poll question? Sure. So as we further consider the challenge of the past year, we'd like to ask a follow-up to the last poll question related to the communication surrounding the COVID-19 crisis. You can see it on your screen now. And the question is, how can the university help people stay connected during this time? And this is a multiple choice with uh, including more of these return to learn town halls, more executive vice chancellor newsletters, communication, more communication from the academic divisions or more communication from departments and finally other. And while people are making their selections, I'd like to ask you, Vice Chancellor Satterland, what have we learned this year about communicating with our students? Well, I, I think like all of us, students would like clear and honest, concise and timely communication with a feedback loop. Uh, they'd like content to be relevant and engaging and creative. And I think our efforts have been most impactful when we've co-created our social media, YouTube videos and written communication with our students. And I think also receiving information when appropriate with a bit of humor, and then of course, uh, useful resources. Um, uh, and again, I think we've learned that uh, our, our communication needs to be uh, more timely and um, more easily digestible uh, for students who are um, busy working and studying and uh, caring for others and, and leading and serving. All right, thank you for that. We're ready for the results from our last poll question. And we can see a a broad dis distribution. 
So once again, we appreciate this feedback and we're gonna take it into account as we look forward to uh, moving forward in this uh, communications effort. So next we're gonna hear from Vice Chancellor for Research, Sandy Brown, and she's gonna tell us about uh, the updates on the research ramp up. Vice Chancellor Brown. Excellent, thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Continetti. Um, to uh, highlight for everyone, we already have over 6,400 uh, uh, people on campus conducting research every day. And our researchers have on their approved research personnel plans, um, approximately 8,000 uh, people. So there are extra people that can be added when we have the opportunity to do that. You can see that the vast majority of uh, these individuals are in about 20 buildings across campus, but increasingly so in many more buildings as we open up for uh, more engagement in a, in a safe fashion. The pie chart on the left uh, shows that we have quite a diversity of people already on campus, ranging from the principal investigators or the lead investigators for those projects uh, other uh, academic personnel and ac uh, non-academic staff, but also undergraduates, graduate students, and our postdoctoral students and fellows. So it's quite an array of individuals that are already on, on board on campus, and uh, we are all ready to ramp up even more to the extent that we can. I'm going to talk with you a little bit about that, if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, while the county is not changing out of its uh, uh, purple designation, at least for a couple of weeks, uh, what we want to do is to be well prepared for any increase in on-site activity and do what we can on campus to uh, immediately today uh, increase the productivity of the labs, because we do know that uh, working like this for over a year has, has really impacted the productivity of the labs, the opportunities for our undergrads, grads, and postdocs as well. So we will, of course, continue with the CDC guidelines, you know, the uh, six feet distancing between people, wearing masks, uh, uh, even for those who are vaccinated, by the way, uh, continue with hand washing sanitation requirements for each of the sites that have already been agreed upon and, and, improved, and approved by uh, EHNS and uh, the department chairs and the deans. Um, but what we can do now is to be sure that we do two things. One, make sure that uh, if you're an investigator who has a research ramp up plan, you have everybody listed in your team on that plan in the appropriate phase that you prioritize them. Uh, so for example, if uh, we were to be able to go to the next phase, uh, uh, be sh we wanna be sure, no, go back please. We wanna be sure that uh, you have all the individuals listed there that you would want uh, to have uh, to come into the laboratory. And uh, I wanna encourage uh, faculty to while well, we have to stay at that 25% uh, limit for your entire team, uh, whatever that 25% of that is, um, think about scheduling. Think about ways that you might uh, be able to have more people in at different times so that you can get more done. And this comes, uh, this includes now uh, our allowance of students uh, that can be added uh, to the plans. Uh, and uh, just by way of reminder, currently, uh, the capa that capacity number is clearly independent of the vaccine status because we were at zero for a portion of time. Now we're all the way up almost 50% on campus and um, uh, the county still holds us to that 25% uh, limit. So how can we increase what we do now and be ready for the big change? The next slide, I'll, I'll share that with you. First of all, I encourage people to update their ramp up plans, make sure that everybody that you want to have come onto campus at some time when, you, when your 
programs up and rolling again, you have them listed in the appropriate place, the, the red, orange, yellow, or green phase. Uh, students can be added now. We had restrictions before. Now students can be added. But again, remembering that uh, we have to maintain a certain cap or they need to be uh, uh, complying with the training protocols that are on the Research Ramp Up website. We still think that we need to prioritize the people on campus, our faculty, staff, uh, and students, as opposed to outside volunteers. And so we're going to continue that restriction until we get uh, an opportunity from the county to increase the uh, on-site uh, activity at a higher level. If you don't have a plan yet, a research ramp up plan, please go ahead and uh, fill one out uh, and just go online at, uh, research at the research ramp up site. Uh, and uh, remember that if it's a brand new plan, then it will go through your department chair and your dean for a, a review um, uh, before you can officially uh, uh, bring people onto campus. In some cases, uh, if you're asking for something that's outside our normal bounds, then it'll need an EHS review, but that would be determined for you. So we don't want people to uh, uh, to bring a larger number on at any site, but we certainly want people to be thinking about using all the time that's available so that we can maximize the activity that we have on campus. And as soon as we get the go ahead from from the county that we could increase the uh, the density, um, you'll be ready to do that. And we can do that with the turn of a switch. Okay. This is just where you can, um, oh, I should remind you, we'll have a research wrap up town hall on the 25th. And this is the where you can get information and fill out your research ramp up uh, materials. So thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you, Vice Chancellor Brown, for your leadership and getting our research enterprise back on track. It's been so important, such an important part of our university. Now it is time to move on to the question and answer segment. So I invite all of our panelists, including Associate Vice Chancellor Carlos Jensen, Associate Dean Judy Kim, Senior ABC Research Miroslav Kerstich, and Dean John Moore to turn on their videos. We follow the same format as we have previously. So during registration, attendees had an opportunity to submit questions for the panelists to answer. You selected some of the most popular questions for the panel today. If you have a question now, of course, please use the Q&A window to submit additional questions during the session and our panelists will do their best to provide answers. Due to time limitations, we may not be able to get to all of your questions. However, we will do our best to post the answers in the FAQ at the return to learn.ucsd.edu website as we have before. So uh, the first question today actually is for Vice Chancellor Brown. And uh, the question is, with the recent changes in uh, the California tiers, has there been any change in the guidance for the number of people allowed in the labs? Oh, this is a wonderful question uh, because we're all ready to increase the on-site activity. The CDC has changed their guidelines, uh, but my understanding is that um, the state has classified our county along with the county regions as remaining in uh, the, the purple tier. So we can't increase the percentage of people that we have at, on uh, campus at any time. But what you can do is you can think about, could I structure th things in a different way so I could bring some people on at certain times and others at other times, uh, includes evenings, weekend times, morning, afternoon shifts, uh, 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 um, uh, day shifts, uh, that kind of thing. And we really do encourage you to do that because uh, we are expecting that within the next few weeks, we'll be able to increase the overall volume of people that we have in the laboratories and the, the research settings at any time. Just two reminders, uh, staff who can work at, at, at home should probably con should continue to do that and no large meetings. Uh, all meetings are done via Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Brown. Uh, I see that uh, Dean Jim McCarrow has joined us. He's the uh, co-chair of the Research Continuity Task Force. So welcome, uh, Dean McCarrow. And uh, the next question is for EVC Simmons. And that, that is, how will the COVID-19 protocols influence in-person teaching in the fall? 
for instance, will group work be okay with masks? Okay, so um, mm -hmm. we will follow the scientific evidence and the county guidelines and state guidelines, of course, in whatever we do in the fall. So um, if we are in a situation that, if we're in the situation that uh, our experts, Dr. Schooley and Dr. Martin are predicting as our best case where we're able to teach in person with normal classroom capacity. In that case, um, just as attending a, uh, a class session would be okay in person, though we'll likely still be wearing masks, then yes, group work would also be okay wearing masks. Um, that is where we are hoping to be. That's where we're planning to be, of course, we will watch what the actual science is telling us at the time. And if we have to pull back from that, we will. Um, Carlos, do you have any additional detail on that one? I, th I think that's uh, beautifully encapsulated. All, all right, thank you. Uh, the next question will also be for you, EVC Simmons. Will students be expected to be vaccinated prior to returning to campus in the fall? If not, can we maintain flexibility for courses? So let me start with the first question, which you could interpret two different ways. One is, do we expect that students will have had the opportunity to get vaccinated before the fall? And what we've been hearing from our, uh, our uh, medical and public health experts is, yes, we do expect that before the fall, all adults, including our students, will have had the opportunity to get vaccinated. An alternative way to view the question is, will the University of California mandate that students must have the vaccine before coming back? That we do not know at this time, partly because we don't know when the vaccines might attain a more normal, vac vac uh, a more normal status. Right now they're approved under an emergency use authorization where it's not clear if the university would, uh, if the University of California would mandate anybody having a vaccine under that level of authorization. So that one we don't know, we're gonna have to stay tuned. Um, uh, can we maintain fle flexibility for courses? We'll, we'll certainly be maintaining flexibility and we will do whatever the science and the public health guidelines say. Um, Chip, Natasha, anything you would want to add? No, I, I think that's well said. I, I think these vaccines are among the best we have. Uh, they're incredibly effective and they seem to be incredibly safe. Um, we require other vaccines for students that aren't as effective. Um, they're, they are safe, but they're not as effective. And this disease is a bad disease. So it's hard to fathom why we wouldn't include this in the same kind of uh, of a of, um, group of vaccines we do for congregate living uh, in other settings like military barracks and colleges and so forth. So I, I, I hope the university moves in that direction with appropriate uh, exemptions for the people who have a reason to have them, but I think it's too early to know. Uh, I think these are vaccines that are so good people should want to have them rather than uh, try to figure out how not to get them myself. All right, thank you. And, and turning to you again, Dr. Schooley, uh, should, should we continue to get weekly COVID testing after being vaccinated with the first dose or the second dose? Uh, we've been looking at um, the um, frequency of shedding after vaccination uh, and uh, both here in, among our healthcare uh, workers where the vaccines got out of the gates a little bit earlier uh, and other manuscripts and things I've seen have been uh, looking at that as well in other settings. And what you see is that for the first couple of weeks, people continue to shed virus. And these are people who got infected before they got vaccinated with the incubation period being what it is. And then as the, um, as the immunity from the vaccines begins to ramp up, the number of people uh, shedding virus and in the studies that have looked at it, the amount of virus they shed declined steadily. So that although people will occasionally shed virus, they shed it for a shorter period of time and at lower levels. Um, with that in mind, I think that what we're gonna be seeing is uh, less and less need to do uh, asymptomatic screening at the frequency we've been doing it. Dr. Martin is doing some mathematical modeling kind of as we speak, probably parallel processing this meeting to try to get an idea about the best 
uh, plan for the uh, for the fall. Uh, let me turn it over to her and see what her thoughts are about those considerations. Yeah, that's just to say that that's something that we are working on right now in terms of thinking about how um, vaccination can uh, help inform our adaptive strategy. We always set out to have an adaptive strategy uh, to change our approach as both the epidemiological circumstances as well as other circumstances like vaccination changes. So we are currently rerunning the models to try and understand how we can adapt that approach most effectively in the in the coming weeks and months. I, I'd like to go back to you, Chip, but what does the evidence say about the likelihood of transmitting COVID-19 once you're fully vaccinated? Uh, we think it's much, much lower uh, based on how much virus is transmitted uh, or is shed and based on uh, the data that were generated during the epidemic itself, looking at transmission uh, uh, in settings uh, in which uh, viral uh, ideas about viral shedding uh, were known. Uh, there is a study that actually is being proposed uh, to be done here on this campus, among other places, uh, among college students, to look at that. Uh, Dr. Susan Little, who led the uh, two studies down at the uh, Antiviral Research Center, uh, is going to present to uh, the campus operations group tomorrow a study that the NIH uh, would like us to consider, in which um, uh, about 500 of our students would be offered the Moderna vaccination and we would then fo uh, uh, follow their contacts to see if uh, their um, acquisition of virus is lower than matched contacts who aren't vaccinated. Once the other students are eligible for vaccination, they would be vaccinated. So this would be basically an opportunity to be vaccinated early in the randomization and to look at this question formally. Um, as a scientist, I think the work needs to be done. Um, if I were somebody who spent time at Del Mar, uh, I, would, I would bet that the vaccines are going to have a major effect on transmission. Excellent. Well, uh, if you'll bear with me, because obviously vaccine questions are high on people's minds uh, at this time. So the question is, would it be safe to receive the Johnson & Johnson vaccine after receiving Pfizer? Johnson & Johnson is better against the new variants, so we could mix the vaccines, no? Uh, no, I mean, not the safety part, but it's not better than uh, the other vaccines against the new strains. Um, the, um, what I think we're going to end up doing is um, having uh, to tweak the vaccines and offer boosters uh, as the variants uh, continue to evolve away from our uh, collective immune response and away from the uh, pressure induced by vaccines in the population. Uh, I think that um, we are going to be mixing, mixing and matching these vaccines. Uh, some of the experience with adenovirus-based vaccines like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine have been that you can't repetitively boost with them because you develop immunity to the adenovirus as well as to the, um, the uh, carrier virus that you're trying to vaccinate against. And if you keep using the same adenovirus, you don't respond to the other uh, vaccine. So, uh, I suspect we're going to see people getting vaccinated first with some people with the um, uh, an adenovirus-based vaccine followed by uh, an RNA-based vaccine. Uh, uh, and those kinds of studies are uh, on the books right now. Excellent. Thank you for that information. Uh, now I'd like to go to uh, Associate Vice Chancellor Jensen. Car Carlos, can you provide some information about summer classes and on-campus programs? Sure. So for uh, the spring and, and the summer, we're hoping to be in the red tier, which means 25% uh, uh, occupancy in the classes, six foot distancing, the same kind of um, protocols that we had in, in place in the fall. Um, for summer, uh, well, through spring and, and summer, we have uh, uh, the dispensation from Senate to provide remote classes uh, without special permission. And so what we're uh, expecting to see over the summer, especially is the same kind of shift to predominantly remote uh, teaching. We had a lot of students who uh, took great advantage of that. It was a great way for them to stay engaged, to uh, either catch up or, or get ahead of their studies. And they responded uh, phenomenally to, to those offerings. Uh, in terms of other on-campus programs, we're going to be very cautious about events. There's not gonna be any uh, events for, for students that are not our own uh, or outside populations, but we do expect um, to be able to have some on-campus activity, including classes, especially using the, the outdoor 
uh, classrooms, they're still gonna be available and some uh, bridge and, and onboarding programs as we get closer to fall. Uh, uh, EVC Simmons, do you have anything that you want to add to that? Um, no, I think um, the only thing that occurs to me is that there, there's one kind of um, activity that's a little bit um, exceptional, which is um, uh, the following. So uh, ABC Jensen was describing um, activities for our own matriculated students or our own students who are about to matriculate with us in the fall. So classes or bridge programs. There's another small segment of programs that are um, uh, long enough uh, that people have a chance to, to move here and settle in and be part of the whole testing program and everything. And these are our very small, but very influential summer REU programs. And the faculty have asked whether there's any way to be able to hold them in person. Each one has maybe a dozen students um, and they really would be part of the, um, uh, the faculty PI's uh, uh, research ramp up plans. And there'd be time to really plan everything carefully. So we are uh, setting up a mechanism to enable our REU programs that are more than seven weeks in length to be able to still happen. That's the only special other special thing we have going on in summer. Again, that's a total of maybe a hundred students uh, maximum, but we thought those were pretty important for faculty research and outreach efforts. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I noticed uh, Vice Chancellor Satterlin that a link uh, to a spring break uh, web page was posted. Can you say a little bit about uh, what, what we can find there? Oh, absolutely. So I wanted to share the link to our uh, spring break calendar, which is ever evolving. I, I met with the spring break collective right before uh, joining the town hall and there are a number of, of events and programs particularly related to service and adventure that are in the process of being added. I also wanted to share that um, all of our programs um, and services have been developed with our disabled students in mind and um, captioning as well as um, 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 our um, appropriate accommodations will be made so all of our students uh, can participate. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Martin, uh, here, here's a one that came in live. So when you are reporting the percent of employees and students vaccinated, are you including people who've been vaccinated outside of the UC system? And there's a follow on. Could that question be asked in our daily symptoms survey until we are vaccinated as a way of gathering further data? Thanks, Bob. So my understanding is that the, the current as, um, coverage estimates are, are just reporting vaccines that have been received here. But I I believe that the uh, campus IT, um, uh, the people working in campus IT are, are trying to investigate whether uh, they could additionally collect data of vaccinations outside the UCSD system. Chip, do you know more about this? Could you comment? Yeah, I, I don't know uh, at the individual level um, how much they know about people vaccinated outside the UC SD system um, because of um, uh, privacy issues in terms of, uh, of employees. Um, we know aggregate numbers of people that have been vaccinated uh, among our own uh, staff, uh, but I don't know that people who are vaccinated elsewhere are reported to us as having been vaccinated elsewhere. Uh, if Chris Longhurst were here, we could ask him, but uh, uh, we'll have to uh, ask the two that you have who are giving you speculative answers. Okay, well, you can take that back to them uh, later. Um, now, uh, EBC Simmons uh, and EBC Jensen, we talked about uh, the fall and summer, but uh, of course, athletics are an important part of the university. And uh, I was wondering, EBC Simmons, can you give us an update on the status of sporting events? Um, well, in fact, I'm going to turn this over to BCSA Sutherland, who oversees athletics and recreation both. Allison. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. So um, we have a very rigorous return to sport plan that was developed in partnership with Dr. Sosha and Dr. Schooley and and Dr. Martin. Um, we're continuing, of course, within the um, expectations of the um, conference um, and also the county. 
We will be examining some of the recent CDC guidelines and state guidelines around um, the potential for fans to join outdoor sporting events. But we are um, just at the beginning stage of, of assessing that. And of course, it'll uh, come to our return to learn committee and to cabinet and to campus operations at the appropriate time. But in the meantime, our scholar athletes uh, continue to participate uh, with uh, our um, Division I uh, scholar uh, partners from uh, scholar athletes from across the state. And I understand that uh, um, we're undefeated in women's basketball in D1, noting, of course, there have been two games thus far, but we'll take it. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another, another live question for Chip, uh, Dr. Schooley. Do we have an idea that all undergrads living on campus can get vaccinated? Is that that's part of the plan? It will be ultimately part of the plan right now. Um, undergraduates who, are, who have jobs in teaching uh, and graduate students who have jobs in teaching are eligible under the state guidelines. Students per se are not eligible. Uh, we anticipate that when we move to tier two, uh, which is the one after the one we're going to next week, that students will be part of that and we'll be able to vaccinate all the students on campus uh, who wish to be vaccinated. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think we've had a good, uh, a good round table here and uh, answered a lot of questions about the vaccine and other aspects of our response and uh, that uh, I think we will... Uh, bring this uh, town hall to a close. So thank you to everyone for your questions. And we will be following up with the, uh, any other written questions that came in uh, by updating the FAQ that is on the Return to Learn website and posting a recording of this town hall as well. I wanna thank the presenters and our guests uh, for sharing their time and information with us today. And I thank you, the faculty of UC San Diego for attending, taking the time and working together as a community to help bring us through these unprecedented times. Also, we encourage you to complete the post-event survey that, that you will receive shortly to help us continue to improve our means of communication during this stressful period. And we appreciate your participation in the polling as well. And that we'll take that into account as we uh, just make decisions on how to, how to work on communication going forward. So this concludes the Return to Learn Faculty Town Hall. The next town hall will be held Tuesday, March 23rd at 11 a.m. for staff. And we heard from Vice Chancellor Brown that the uh, Return to Research uh, Faculty Town Hall is on the 25th. Uh, so thank you, take care, stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you all on campus again soon. Thank you.